compelling detective story, a cloak and dagger action and a romantic drama, all these stories were taken from real life. The history of Kazakhstan is inseparable from the world history. Reflections on history, our version. The remains of the day. He disembarked at the upper wharf of Ustkmenogorsk. This man of average height was in his 40s. He was wearing glasses, a canvas jacket and holding a shabby bag. He was an ordinary person who could be an office clerk or a trader. His documents showed him to be Pavel Bakayev, insurance agent to the Kolchak patrol and headed to the city. While walking, he thought about his difficult road, not the distance he had to cover, but the obstacles he had to overcome on his way. There is nothing invented here. In some cases, even the names of places and characters haven't been changed. This book would be published a few years later, but it would only cover the beginning of the story. As for the rest of the events, there were only short extracts from the letters, diaries and working plans which he combined under the title The Remains of the Day. The time that the storyteller Bajov spent in the Uskminogorsk was the most mysterious time in his life. He was a partisan and he kept his silence like a real partisan. He didn't publish his recollections. There was some information saying that he had died. Chapter 1 Double-barreled surname. He was a venerable father of the family, a seminary graduate and a teacher. After Pavel Bajov turned 17, a lot of dramatic events occurred in his life. He volunteered for the Red Army, took out the gold reserves of Kamushlov town, edited the newspaper Trench Truth. Later he was taken prisoner and from there he escaped into the dense taiga where he participated in the formation of a partisan unit and was eventually given another secret mission. There is a profiteering feat and economic initiative changing the workplace, insurance secret service. There are only a few sentences and scores of different versions. What do these words conceal? Researchers have solved the riddle of the last two entries. Bajov was really an insurance agent and he used this as a cover. His services were in demand in difficult periods. Thus it provided an opportunity to travel in the region without causing any suspicions. The future storyteller didn't only change where he worked. He had a few surnames. One of them was Bakayev. The letter Z was divided and became K. Then the letter E was added. The writer used real documents for this purpose. According to them, the surname of Pavel Petrovich was not Bajov, but Bajev. It derived from the word Bajit, which meant telling fortunes or predicting. Finally, it became Bakayev, Bajov. The second variant of his surname was Bakmetyev, and the third one was Kirabayev. He had a new surname and changed his appearance. Even his wife didn't recognize him without his beard. Only his goals remained the same. They were looking for people holding the same views about forming an underground movement. Did he go into hiding? Yes, he did, because Kolchak gangs were here. The walls were 1.5 meters high and concealed behind them were floggings with cleaning rods, executions and overcrowded cells. A part of Uskamenogorsk fortress was one of the oldest structures in the city. After the Bolsheviks were overthrown, it was renamed South Siberian Schlesenburg in reference to the St. Petersburg Central Prison for political prisoners. This is a pre-trial detention center. This building used to be situated close to Uskamenogorsk fortress. It was built in approximately the middle of the 19th century. Convicted soldiers and political prisoners were put here. A revolt broke out here on the night of June 29, 1919. It was suppressed cruelly and only two Bolsheviks out of 197 rebels survived. I was a 13-year-old boy and I saw the event. It remained in my memory. About 10 or 15 people were wounded. As for the dead, there were many of them. I was shocked by the sight and ran away. I stumbled over corpses, boxes, heads smashed to pieces and separated from the bodies. A pile of sugar spilled over with blood. Repression was resumed, which didn't make Kolchak's regime more popular. Therefore, the future author of the Malachite box arrived in Uskomenogorsk in the most dangerous period, which at the same time was the most suitable time for his mission. 
Chapter 2 Fearless Agent There's an old hive frame belonging to a beekeeper who was an old believer, a merchant shop and the house of a wealthy Kazakh who bred red deer. It feels like it would be easy to walk along this shady alley into the past. This is the house where Pavel Petrovich lived from 1919 to 1920. The house belonged to a peasant woman, Ryabova, and was situated in Verknayest, Pristan village in Tomsk province. Now it's in Kaban by Batir Street. The village was situated three kilometers away from Ustkaminogorsk and had become a part of the East Kazakhstan region a long time ago. Each beam of the house was transferred with care to this park. History has remained preserved, which is why it's easy to imagine Bajov or Bakayev waiting for the information of his informants on the porch. The landlady Matryona Ryabova was a messenger with whom he kept in touch with the Altai partisans. Kazakh Bayesh Utapov acted as a guide in the steppe villages and nomad territories. Bayash Utapov helped Pavel Petrovich, who did not speak Kazakh, carry out an in-depth research into the life and situation of the Kazakhs working in the Rida Akshtal mine and village steppe. He also visited the villages of the Old Believers and gold mines where he agitated and wrote leaflets which later were stuck on the fences by members of underground organizations in broad daylight. However, only this document written in dots and dashes has remained. It says, business travel, Shemonaika exploration, Jesus shelves, Zminogorsk evacuation. He was the only one who understood what these events meant. Unfortunately, we don't have the personal archives of Bajov. What we have are official documents prepared when Bajov was working in Skaminogorsk. However, we don't have many of those either. There are also memoirs and a letter from his wife, Valentina. She arrived here with her children in July 1919. According to some information, initially, the Bajovs had to conceal not only the fact that they were married, but even that they knew each other. The family arrived here during an outburst of counter-revolution, meaning that in July 1919, the Bolsheviks didn't hold power here. There was nothing like this to him. Counter-revolutionary terror was being used. It was even prohibited to say within the family what he was engaged in. The insurance agent of the 3rd Zminogorsk district handled his work well and the group of member numbers had increased to 1,000 people by autumn. The 1st Regiment of Altai Red Mountain Eagles was soon formed, led by the communist Nikita Timofeyev. Did he participate in combat? Yes, of course. Bajov was in the regiment of Altai Red Mountain Eagles. There are no documents confirming that he was involved in punitive actions. There were five months of underground work. The United Forces of the Mountain Eagles and insurgent peasant army headed by Kozir. After that, the Soviet control returned to Ustkmenogorsk. Chapter 3, Altai Past Events According to another version, Kozir, together, and his people entered the city after Kolchak was overthrown and didn't join the Red Eagles. His name is mentioned more often than any other names in the notes of soldiers from the peasant regiments. These were used in the first draft of Bajov's novel. It's mentioned in the 35th paragraph for the first time. The prison is mentioned in the same sentence. There's a little known fact in the writer's biography. Bajov was held in South Siberian Schlesenburg. It was a shady situation, but it's obvious that Kozir was involved in it. It wasn't easy to establish Soviet power in Altai due to its proximity to the border, behind which the remaining parts of the defeated White Guard troops were hiding. Gangs operated in the districts. Kazir's band operated under the slogan, For Soviets Without Bolsheviks, seized Ustkaminogorsk for two weeks. According to some information, the Bolsheviks were arrested, while another source says that control of the city was split between them. According to a third source, Kazir was defeated through subterfuge. The reason was that all of his comrades in arms were convinced by Bajov's rousing speeches and three Red Guards regiments which arrived to help, and as a result they finally defected to the Soviets of deputies. Meanwhile, the rumor spread that Pavel Petrovich had been executed. However, when they found out that he was alive and working in Uskaminogorsk, the Uskaminogorsk committee received a telegram with a demand to return him to Kamushlovo. 
In reply, the Uskaminagorsk Bureau said that they wanted Bakayev to stay in Uskaminagorsk because they needed competent employees. Bajov Bakayev published the Soviet Power newspaper. There's a legend according to which the previous owner of the printing house threw the machines in the Ulster River so that the Red Army wouldn't get them. Nevertheless, the Red Army extracted the machines from the river bottom and repaired them. Besides this, Bajov Bakayev was also a representative of the Russian Commissariat and head of the Education Department. So he held many posts. There are documents from January the 11th, 1920, showing that he was appointed head of the Information and Instruction Subdivision. There's even a historical anecdote related to this matter. After a piano on a ship was appropriated by workers, its previous owner went to the various authorities to complain. He went to the Department of Education and saw Bakayev there. Then he went to the management department of the Revolution Committee, where he also again found Bakayev. When he went to the Surplus Appropriation System Department, Bakayev was there too. The man brought his complaint to several officers and everywhere he encountered Pavel Petrovich. Finally, he decided to write a letter to a newspaper and found out that the same person was the editor-in-chief of that newspaper. Most of all, he was interested in the education of the Kazakh population at the time. It should be said that one of the orders issued by Bajov in 1920 was an order to establish a Kazakh troop in the regional theatre. Each document is a short story. There are recollections of the future writer's wife. The times were troubled. During the day they built a new life and at night they continued the destruction of the previous one. Bajov was also a member of a special purpose unit. Being tired and worried, they took their rifles and left before morning. Pavel Petrovich went with them. Quite often people didn't return after their duty and I spent these terrible, disturbing nights without sleep. I sat waiting for his return and couldn't know whether he was alive or not. It's interesting that after Soviet power was established and he had held various posts for a year and a half, he was mentioned in all documents and recollections as Bakayev. In February 1921, Pavel Bakayev was elected as a member of Semipalatinsk Party City Committee. Although he caught malaria, he continued working around the clock. Because of the disease, he became very weak and his legs were too weak to hold him. The doctors said that his state could only improve if he were went to a place with a different climate. So in 1921, Pavel Petrovich was allowed to go to Ural. The climate could have been an excuse because the climate in Ural is quite similar to East Kazakhstan. Perhaps at the time, Bajov's double life wasn't over yet. Incidentally, residents of Uskomenogorsk only found out in 1950s that the famous storyteller Bajov had participated in shaping the bright future of Altai. Epilogue. Blank slate. I wanted to show Altai with its dwellers wearing homespun coats and sheepskins with cashmere tassels. They are from a partisan detachment. These men and women are called the regiments of mountain eagles. I'm writing without lifting my pen. He planned to write 32 books dedicated to the revolution. The first of them, called For the Soviet Truth, was published in 1926. His work on the book Formation on the Go coincided with a wave of repression and all the main characters were considered enemies of the people. Bajov was attacked with denunciations and was expelled from the party and dismissed. A suitcase containing warm clothes was packed and put near the door. Although Bajov was an adherent of the new government, he was punished for it, for writing about this government. He was lucky because the investigator who carried out the investigation was also repressed. However, nobody saw what Bajov wrote without lifting his pen. Nothing remained in drafts, archives or museums except this draft plan. Perhaps it wasn't a coincidence that he got a serious disease from which he couldn't recover. There were years of silence and terrible death of his only son. It seemed that the string of bad luck would never end. But he was saved by the Malachite box, Stone Flower and the Mistress of the Copper Mountain, which we remember from our childhood. He received the award of Stalin, was elected a deputy, gained recognition and even further awards. The remains of the day began from a blank slate, however there will be another story about it.